First of all, let's just start with the very, very basics. Um, what is plastic pollution and why should we, there be conservation efforts towards it? Why is it a concern for people and the ecosystem as well? Well, you say this is simple. I was actually asked this question for the very first time the other day. And I've been working with Beach Guardian and researching plastic pollution for, you know, almost a decade now. And answering what is plastic pollution is so multifaceted because plastic pollution isn't just, you know, one issue. And likewise, there isn't just one solution. But in the simplest of terms, obviously, plastic is well known. It's infiltrated all of our lives. We use it in our daily lives. And plastic pollution is when that plastic goes into the environment. It can either be lost or discarded or dumped or just simply emitting through the waste streams that we that we put it into. And the reason that we need to tackle this is that not only does it, you know, it's at a very basic level is an eyesore. It's a, it's a cosmetic problem. It doesn't look good. It has threats to wildlife in that, um, you know, with the microplastics, they can be ingested. The larger items can pose this entanglement risk. But also my research looks at whether microplastics can spread disease and expose people and animals to more disease. And then aside from the wildlife, plastic is threatening human health as well. So there are so many different problems associated with plastics. Yeah, I saw a statistic and it was like one in 17 people have microplastics in their bloodstream. Is that is that true at all? Yeah, I mean, there's... It's only been in the last couple of years, really, that papers have started to be published looking at plastics in the human body. And like you say, we've got plastic in our blood, plastic in our lungs, plastic in human breast milk, plastic in placentas. So we know it's there. We just don't know what it's doing. So all of this, this research is very, very novel. Right. And I'm guessing... Because your research is focusing on, is it antibiotic resistant bacteria on the microplastics? So if it's in the lungs, the bloodstream or the placenta, etc., would that, I'm guessing that would uh, cause the human to be infected with this bacteria, which antibiotics can't cure. So I'm guessing that is a very severe thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very, very kind of... Um... <laughs> As I said, the research is very novel and we're just trying to understand what's going on. But the conclusion you're drawing is one that I'm kind of trying to prove myself. We know that microplastics go into the environment. We know that when the microplastics are in the environment, they become colonised by bacteria. We know that the bacteria on microplastics is quite frequently distinct so those communities are different to those that are in the surrounding environment and on natural substrates like wood. We also know that microplastics get eaten and we know that microplastics are more likely to be eaten if they have bacteria on them because it masks the not natural smell of plastics. So my research is really trying to investigate whether microplastics are like a vessel to carry these like disease causing right. yeah. or potentially antibiotic resistant bacteria research is starting to uncover what the the role of microplastics as this vessel is in wildlife but when you start looking at the transmission to humans at the top of that chain nobody's investigated this at all in my PhD, I won't be able to answer that question. That's like postdoc fellowship yeah. levels, but <laughs> you know, it it very well could be happening. Can it pass through species as well? For example, if, you, if there's a fish that has microplastics in it, and you eat that fish, would that transfer to you? Yeah. So this is the kind of this is one of my hypotheses. Is um, a lot of microplastic research is looking at something called bioaccumulation, which is where you see like the primary producers at the base of the food chain ingesting microplastics like zooplankton, plankton. And then once they get ingested, because the whole organism would be eaten, so say a fish comes along and eats the plankton, the microplastics go into the fish. And then if a shark comes along and eats the fish, then the microplastics go into the shark. Or, you know, we come along and eat those fish, the microplastics come into us. And even if the microplastics themselves have been excreted by the animal, there could be an accumulation of toxins, um, chemicals associated with the plastics, 
or those bacteria that are associated with the plastics. And the reason that bioaccumulation is so bad is if you think one plankton could eat, let's say, five microplastics, and then a fish comes along and eats five plankton. So they've got 25 microplastics. Oh, yeah. And then a person comes along and eats four fish. They've got 100 microplastics. So the higher you go in the food chain, the more plastics you could be accumulating. So there's like a trophic level increase with plastic, yeah. microplastics. And I'm guessing for all species, maybe, isn't it like an endocrine stopper? Doesn't it sort of affect the endocrine system, the hormones in humans and other animals? Is there like sort of science on what hormones it's producing? Yeah, so you're exactly right. Um, so within plastic production, the, the plastics themselves are impregnated with a lot of chemicals. And these chemicals have a large kind of um, array of different um, purposes. So flame retardants, plasticizers, um, antimicrobials themselves to stop them being kind of colonized by bacteria. Um, you know, especially with COVID, we started seeing that anything that had an antimicrobial compound in was suddenly this is antibacterial or antiviral because right. you don't want to touch it and you know catch COVID, whatever. Um, so these chemicals exist in plastics and they can leach out of the plastics potentially into wildlife and people. This is particularly concerning when, say, you have a coffee cup, like a polystyrene coffee cup, and that's got all kinds of chemicals in. You put hot water in and that heat uh, encourages the leaching of those chemicals from the plastic into the liquid and that goes into our body. And you're exactly right. One of the biggest concerns, aside from carcinogenics, is that a lot of these plastics are endocrine disruptors, which um, it, you know moderates hormone production. Mm. One of the the most concerning areas of research is um, that quite often they're estrogen inhibitors, so they can uh, affect the reproductive capability of the the person ingesting the, those chemicals, not just for females but males too. Yeah, that's quite concerning. And I think um, there's there's so many issues with the ocean. It's, it's quite not issues, but like uh, things happening towards the ocean. And it's definitely um, it's definitely overwhelming at times if you consider all of these factors. I mean, you've got plastic pollution. But when we talk about uh, ingesting them ourselves with different types of plastic, that also brings the sort of topic of not only is it plastic pollution, but just plastic water bottles. I mean, I think 30 to 50 percent of all water we drink is like older than the sun or something don't quote me on that but um it's older than the sun so despite water being so old you get a plastic water bottle and it expires in like a year so because yeah. of because i'm guessing that's because of the plastics coming into it right yeah i mean I, that's a really interesting perspective that i've not heard before um i was actually i hosted a workshop yesterday with a group there was like 30 young people of 16 17 part of the Exeter Scholars Programme and um, they, I said to them you know on average the average person eats a credit card worth of plastic every week and really? they said uh, how I don't remember eating a credit card <laughs> yeah. kind of thing and I was like these exposure routes are just like so commonplace that you wouldn't know you're eating plastic you know um, drinking water for example, is one of the predominant sources of microplastics. And actually drinking bottled water is worse for you in terms of ingesting microplastics than tap water. Uh, sea salt, for example, even beer has microplastics in. And actually one of the, the most predominant exposure routes um, for humans to microplastics is just breathing, <laughs> which is just like really awful because obviously that's something we, we can't stop. Yeah your homes if you have a tumble dryer a lot of the clothes we wear are synthetic fabrics mm. um nylon and this kind of thing and when you put those synthetic fabrics into a tumble dryer all of those fibers well, all of the fibers but a proportion of those fibers comes off and you know you have your lint uh, in your tumble dryer and they become aerosolized into into your home so you could just be walking around in your home with the tumble dryer running breathing and you're ingesting microfibers is there a solution towards that surely there's some sort of filter you can put on the tumble dryer and stop that from happening Yes, exactly. So um, that's that's exactly right. So lots of different companies have started developing washing machine filters 
to filter out these these microfibers to stop them going into the environment and also i suppose stop them becoming as uh, as aerosolized in your homes an example um, would be the company planet care they produce these amazing filters you send back the uh, microfibers that you collect they get recycled etc cetera, etc cetera. um i i believe and don't quote me on this but i'm pretty sure france just passed legislation where all new washing machines have to be installed with these filters. In the UK, uh, the all-party parliamentary group on antibiotics, which is uh, hosted by the Women's Institute, is currently campaigning for the same legislation to be implemented here in the UK. Um, but I think we're, we're a long way off that being passed just yet. Yeah, no, it sounds like there's definitely progression towards it, and that's promising i think that that's the sort of like hope we sort of hold on to and I, i'm quite uh, excited for it and obviously the research towards it and the progression uh we have towards it but um there's a lot happening to the ocean you've got like harmful algal blooms and you know you've got plastic pollution and many more what made you choose plastic pollution in both research and your charity as well yeah this is this is a great question um for me Plastic pollution hits home more than the other threats. So I remember when I was at school, I was learning about global warming. And and this is like primary school. I was sort of like, what's that, six, seven? <laughs> uh, yeah, right? Um, so we're, we're learning about global warming and, you know, seeing pictures of polar bears without ice to live on and this kind of thing. I was like, okay, well, I want to help. I want to get involved and protect the planet from global warming. What can I do? And then, like, turn your lights off. Make sure your TV's not on standby kind of thing. So I would do those things, and I wouldn't see the polar ice cap that I'm saving. But then growing up in Cornwall, all of my, like, favourite childhood memories are down on the beach. And if I look back through those memories, they are also polluted with plastic. I also remember being six and seven, building sandcastles on the beach and decorating them with plastic pollution. And this is like 20 years ago now. So I've always been exposed to plastics. It affects my home. You know, I I live very close to the beach, very lucky in that sense. So I see it on a daily basis. And what I love about plastic pollution as, as, as an issue to tackle is that you very quickly and very easily get that rewarding feeling of knowing you've made a difference. For example, you go to a beach, you see that it's covered in plastic, you can see the microplastics, you can see the macroplastics, you spend half an hour doing a beach clean, and it's clean. Instantly, you're like, I made a difference. I did something. I have made this proactive choice to contribute, and it's making a difference. And there is no other environmental issue that gives you that instant reward. And I always discuss, like, Plastic pollution, beach cleaning is like the gateway drug to becoming a better conservationist. Like you do a beach clean, you get that reward and you're like, what else can I do? Maybe I'll go and do a protest for climate change. Maybe I'll change my diet. All of these other things that if you had started with doing a protest or changing your diet, maybe you wouldn't have had that so much empowerment because you can't actually see the difference that makes. Yeah, exactly. I've done beach cleans before and it, it definitely gives you that instant sort of thing of knowing how unbelievably littered a beach can be. And then even sometimes when it doesn't look that bad, by the end of the day, you look at the stack of rubbish you've collected yeah. and like, whoa, that's a lot. Like, cumulative yeah. on the beach, like, whoa, that's a, it builds up. And it's one of those things where the public and on the media and stuff definitely tackle plastic pollution so much. I mean, a couple of years ago, plastic straws, that was a huge thing. But they've yeah. now got paper straws everywhere just because it's such a visual sort of thing. And if you go on Google and google plastic pollution there is like the worst photos that you yeah. can see and um because obviously it's, it's so visual and it's so like uh easy to see you know, like a turtle choking mm-hmm. on like a straw or a plastic bag etc and uh yeah that, that that's why it's quite uh heartbreaking in that regard and very rewarding to do beach cleans and um see conservation towards it but you mentioned your litter picking events what is the um because your charity is called beach garden we actually haven't mentioned that yet but um what does your average beach clean look like you know how do you organize it how do you set it up for anyone listening that might actually want to set up their own beach clean but think it might be a bit bit too big of an event to have 
Yeah, I mean, doing a beach clean, it, 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 it can be very easy and it's such good fun. It really is. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm biased and probably a bit of a weirdo with this obsession with plastic, but it really is good fun. And it, it's what I love about beach cleaning is it's as much as a social thing as it is environmental. You know, you're bringing people together, people from different backgrounds. Quite often we have vulnerable people on our beach cleans, you know, people suffering with their mental health, loneliness, isolation, addiction, this kind of thing. But the actual hosting of a beach clean, you don't need a huge amount of equipment. And there is a lot of different groups that can help you with this. So first thing, if you just want to do your own solitary beach clean or just go with your family, the best and easiest thing you can do is Google two minute beach clean and two minute beach clean have these beach clean boards set up in various different locations all across the UK. In these beach clean boards, you will find a litter picker, a bag and there's antibacterial spray. So you can literally just turn up to a beach, help yourself to a litter picker, do a beach clean and take a picture, you know, find some stuff. And it's really, really easy and accessible. If you want to host a community beach clean, all you need are litter pickers, bags, gloves, sometimes bag openers, depending on what bags you have. But that's about it. You just need something to pick up the litter with and something to put the litter in. And that is it. Um, of course, you have to be cautious of health and safety. But in Cornwall, we have this fantastic organisation called Clean Cornwall. And if you log your beach clean or register your beach clean with Clean Cornwall, then they can provide you with a risk assessment. They can come and collect the waste once you're done. So there are lots and lots of different ways um, for you to host a beach clean and be supported in doing that. That sounds great. No, hopefully, uh, hopefully some people have the incentive to uh, organise some. And who knows, maybe I'll do it myself one day. I could, <laughs> it seems a good thing to do. I've done it before and I might definitely, definitely do that again. Like, I don't think I've known anyone that's done a beach clean going, cool, that was a waste of time. I won't mm -hmm. do that again. Everyone leaves going, that was good. I, I actually enjoyed that. It's a nice sort yeah. of like time to meet people and, uh, you know, do some good conservation. Yeah. But um, you, you have a YouTube channel. And um, what was it like as a conservationist to have a YouTube channel and sort of like publicize your work on there? What did you what did you sort of think of it? Yeah, I mean, so social media has been our greatest ally at Beach Guardian, you know, as a charity or, or, or non-government organization, I should say, having these tools freely available to us has meant you know it takes our messages our very local community-based messages and communicates them globally and that has been absolutely essential and doing the cut the videos and the blogging and this kind of thing I, I never foresaw that that would be part of what I do but I I think it's important when you're in a conservation role to to be a science communicator and be able to communicate these various things and and also you know you have to remember when I started the YouTube channel this was um when I was working full-time at Beach Guardian I'm now part-time because of my PhD but, but I was spending a lot of time actually in the environment like on the front line seeing so many different things you know I was I was on the beach every single day and I saw some things that you wouldn't even believe I I was able to you know I saw evidence of things being entangled in plastic waste I saw beaches that were smothered absolutely choked in microplastics and I was seeing those things I was like on my own I needed to find a way for everybody else to see these things too so having my phone and just being able to do like 30 second videos here and there meant that I was taking all of the things that I was seeing and just showing them to everyone else and and that is essential that is that's really important I think that's why it's so good for social media as well because what a lot of social media is is you're showing people especially with YouTube and stuff you're showing people things that they will not see normally on a day-to-day -day basis so if you're going to the beach every single day and you're seeing yeah. these insane amounts of uh, plastic on the beaches that's then going to open the eyes of people that won't see that and exactly. then realize how big of a problem it is. And it's not like it's not relevant to the average person. Everyone's around plastics. I'm probably holding plastic right now, Mike. You know, yeah. like as the you know, this second I'm like involved in plastic. So it's relevant to 
pretty much everyone as well so um that's what makes plastics uh very unique uh yeah. issue in conservation yeah you know that's actually something that i regularly say and i'm so glad you've said it because that that is the reason why we all have to do something right it's like if i look around my desk i see plastic everywhere this is an issue that affects everybody everybody on the planet there is not one person that this does not affect and i guarantee like almost that like, maybe the people that live in the most remotest areas but even then plastic is starting to get imported to them like plastic is absolutely everywhere but that is the reason that we can tackle this is because there is something for everybody to do everybody can get involved in this campaign exactly yeah and you know watching through your videos your later videos were you know during the peak of the covid period and there was a lot of ppe pollution like an insane amount just face mask plastic gloves etc and I saw in the news as well a lot of concern about it. So it wasn't even just, you know, you and your channel talking about it. It was even like BBC was definitely bringing it um, to surface. So how bad was it? And is it still bad now? Obviously, it's been like three years since uh, yeah. the COVID sort of situation. The PPE pollution problem um, was was a big one for us because that was something we'd never experienced before. And it was quite a unique opportunity because that was the first time there was like a new plastic pollution item that we could monitor. Like we, and we have this whole like timeline of PPE pollution where the pandemic started and then it started bec to become like mandatory for all of, uh, you know, for us to wear these items in various spaces. And then all of a sudden we start to see them spilling out into the environment in various quantities. And we could almost see how quick we could track how quickly PPE pollution, this new plastic pollutant, went from the land to the rivers, to the beaches, to the ocean. And it was a totally unique scenario for us. It was really bad in the sense that we'd never found a face mask before on any of our beach cleans. Never. And we find, you know, name anything and we would have found it before but a face mask, no. And then on every single beach clean, we would find one. So in terms of what it's like now, we we don't find any PPE really. Uh, maybe good. you know, one in four, one in five beach cleans, we will find PPE, but it does seem to be curbed uh, a little bit. Yeah, and I'm guessing during the peak of it all, it was like pretty much every single beach clean by the looks of it. Even oh, yeah. I was seeing it, you know, on the streets everywhere. So yeah. what? Well, how does it end up there? That's my question. How does it actually end up there? Because surely people are just binning them. Are people just outright just throwing them in the rivers or the oceans? How How is it ending up at our beaches? Yeah, you'd think that people were binning them. But I think during the pandemic, um, we did see a change in perception on like people touching things you know because people were very very cautious you know we've only just started shaking hands again kind of thing like people wouldn't touch surfaces people wouldn't touch anything that didn't belong to them and I've, even if people's face masks like blew off when they were like walking from a shop to their car or you know it sounds so silly to like be so specific with examples, but you know, if people went into a supermarket, had all their bags of shopping, opened their car door, and I know a lot of people had face masks like in the like pocket down the side of their car door and they all blew out, they wouldn't go and pick them up or other people wouldn't go and pick them up because of that, that concern that they are going to get sick from touching someone else's waist. So once those kind of things happen where the masks blow off and they're in the, the um, like, um, what, what am I thinking? Like in, in um, what's the opposite of rural? Urban. When they're in urban, thank you. When they're in urban spaces, then it rains or it's windy and they end up going into river systems and then the river carries them into the ocean. So it, it seems very simple, but that's basically what was happening. Yeah, I'm guessing there's a load of different examples. My sort of 
mind went to having them in plastic bags, but then having seagulls just peck at them and then just fling yeah. them away. That definitely has to happen to at least a couple. You know, there's many different routes by the sounds of it. And because we talked about the tumble dryer and the, the microplastics in the air because of that, surely that's also the face mask as well. If you like breathe on it, maybe warm it up, maybe it's the air circulating. Are you actually breathing in plastic when having a face mask on? Is that was that happening at all yeah I mean I'm sure there is research on this I haven't read any myself but I think that's quite a logical conclusion to come to um I have seen there is research uh that looks at when these face masks are go, go into the environment the colonization of bacteria on those face masks because of course they're designed to sort of capture particles and microbes as you breathe so there is research that looks at the bacteria that um, persists on those masks whilst they're in the environment and similar to my research the role of those masks in harboring antimicrobial resistant disease causing organisms so there's there is still a concern uh, with these masks being in the environment of of posing a, a threat to human health that actually reminds me of a field trip I went to. And that's actually the first time we actually uh, spoke as well. I was at a field trip with the university and there's a bunch of PhD students there and you were one of them. And I think the first thing I heard you say was something like there's like 20 odd different antibiotic bacteria species or something in the oceans, even though like Falmouth was a very clean sort of area. I was thinking like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She's saying there's like, if you can go in there with an open wound or like you know just you know ingest it and then yeah, you're infected that... with some sort of resistant bacteria that was yeah like, i think that oh. was um i think i was talking about the findings from the beach bum study that was hosted by um Anne leonard dr Anne leonard with the university of exeter and she basically her research looked at human exposure to drug resistant e coli looking at people who regularly use the water environment for recreational purposes, so bathing, uh, surfing, and the people who don't use the water. And what she found was the people that regularly use the water and they could ingest the water through it, you know, being splashed or whatever, are more likely to be colonised by drug-resistant E. coli than people who do not use the water environment. So it's suggesting that the water be using it for recreational purposes is the exposure route to these drug resistant bugs i'm guessing people would hear that and then i can definitely get a fear like put up a fear that's uh, something i've said but like, there's nothing scarier than a conservationist that's doing a phd they'll always like <laughs> say something across the line that's just like whoa hold on i <laughs> didn't know that <laughs> it's it's um i actually heard that study from michael voss actually i was in yeah, one yeah. of his lectures and he, he was bringing it up so yeah I've, I've heard that before but some people can hear these sort of things and then think they can get quite scared of it. They can yeah. maybe that can deter them away from going to the beach. But the beach is such a great place. And despite these, you know, transmission routes, you shouldn't feel like you shouldn't go to the beach. You shouldn't be scared of everything, you know? Yeah. No, 100 percent. You know, you have to. At Beach Guardian, we're very, very careful with our messaging because who's going to join a campaign that is already doomed? Yeah. Who's, who's going to join a campaign if they feel like they cannot possibly make a difference? So we always go with the attitude of choosing hope over fear. And like I, I've been a victim of it myself. Like I've done a beach clean and at the start of the beach clean been like, what what am I doing? Like it's, it's not making a difference. You know, I, there's one beach clean in particular where there was a massive, massive storm and th the amount of microplastics on this beach, I, don't, I couldn't even give you a number. I couldn't even estimate how much there was because it, it was unquantifiable. It was just like, it looked like snow. You could not see the sand. And I remember seeing that and being like, I know that if I clean this up today on the next tide tomorrow, it's probably all going to come back in the same quantities. What are we? And this was like, four years into doing Beach Guardian, I was like, are we making a difference? But then I spent like an hour on my hands and knees with a dustpan and brush sweeping up some of this microplastic. And within an hour, a portion of the beach was spotless. And I was like, okay, 
I am making a difference. Because if I'd have sat there and been like, this is hopeless, I'm going home, then it would all still be in the environment. But the very fact that I, you know, didn't do that and changed my my outlook and did take action, I got millions, if not billions of microplastics off the beach that day. And we kept going. We were there for like six hours getting microplastics off the beach. So you have you have to change your way of thinking and take that feeling of hopelessness and turn it into hope. Exactly. And I think as someone that, you know, I've got a degree in conservation. Well, yeah, technically graduating in a couple of weeks. So I haven't got it yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> but with my course mates, with, with my course mates, you can see so many of them are just like paralyzed in the fear of there's so many things. You've got climate change, you've got plastic pollution and, and everything. And it's just like you can tell the perception of it isn't healthy and they're actually diminishing their quality of life because of it. You know, some people that are so concerned about certain things, they'll just diminish their quality of life and think that they're using that as a moral virtue for yeah. saving the planet and yes become eco-friendly yeah yes you know do do good things um, be sustainable etc but you got to make sure you're not diminishing your quality of life because in essence that's what's going to help your local community if you're treating yourself poorly and you feel bad about yourself um because you know you're just not eating right or you just like I, I don't know can't give any examples off the top of my head but like if you're diminishing your quality of life, you'll feel worse. You'll treat yourself worse. Therefore, you're going to treat others around you worse. Your local community is going to get diminished because you're trying to think that you're doing so much for the environment. When in actual fact, the best way to tackle uh, conservation from what I've seen in my many years of it is to make sure you're having the best quality of life as possible and then show through example. You know, yeah. people people always saying, you know, um, you know, what do you want to do as a career? And I say conservation, and they immediately think that I'm going to be one of these, um, you know, Greta Thunberg people that are like storming the streets of like London, talking about this and that. And it's like, no, I genuinely focus on improving my quality of life in the best way possible, and then seeing how nature relates to human health, and then just spending the rest of my life, or so I see it, as educating people and how nature benefits human health for the better and how some aspects like plastic pollution that's why we're here today how plastic pollution diminishes it and why it needs attention so that's yeah. what i'm focusing on so i think this perfectly complements what i'm trying to do so that, yeah. that's what that's what we're here for that was really powerful actually i think that is a incredible perspective to have and beach guardian like massively shares in that in that we're doing this to empower people we're doing this to empower communities we're doing this to bring people together yes it is about the planet yes it is about wildlife but in doing these things you know i i beach clean for selfish reasons it helps my mental health it keeps me yeah. happy and healthy wouldn't call that selfish. I yeah i would say i don't know <laughs> things that improve mental health i wouldn't call that selfish but yeah i see no, what you you're mean right you're right but yeah that's uh no it's honestly a great work by the looks of it so you were, by the looks of it, I think you were also the Green Party, you were intern at the Green Party peer in the House of Lords, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, as part of my PhD, I've been doing a, a placement as a senior policy intern with Baroness Bennett, who is a Green Party peer with the UK House of Lords. And with that internship, uh, I'm still working in it now, I finish in September. It's been absolutely incredible. The, the kind of purpose of the the internship is to really look at the antimicrobial resistance policy landscape here in the UK and to look at it from an angle of this concept of one health which is that animal human and environmental health are all interlinked and that's been really incredible and um we're just finalizing a project at the moment which we're launching in London next week which has been this huge consultation with experts, uh, the industry, policymakers, looking at the threat of pharmaceuticals, human pharmaceuticals in the environment and how we can better tackle those threats. And again, that's looking at the endocrine disrupting hormone, um, the endocrine disrupting chemicals, looking at antimicrobials and how they might be driving antimicrobial resistance. So yeah, it's it's been an amazing internship and to be able to see legislation change and how policy works from the inside, you know, looking inside parliament has been mind blowing.
No, that sounds really good. So I'm guessing the whole politics sort of thing is a completely different aspect to conservation and environmentalists, but also it complements it, but the mindset is very different. How yeah. have you sort of seen politics? Did you see things now from a more political sort of way um, rather than like an environmentalist sort of thing through that internship? I think I think so, yeah. I mean, what it's taught me is I, I see how things work. I see how the work that... So I I can see how the evidence that I generate through my PhD and my career in academia can be used to inform work, conservation work, but also can be used to inform policy. And I can see how to better do that. But what I have learned, which I had never really considered before, is you know how to play the system <laughs> yeah yeah and i don't mean that in in, in like a, a negative way at all but before doing my internship um with beach guardian i would always be like you know um kind of a bit abstract in my advice to people on how they can instigate change i'd be like you know just talk about these threats work in your community like keep it all lovey lovey like really kind of um you know a bit of a cliche in in conservation of just you know, being happy and being with people and finding your tribe and this kind of thing which i, I do still agree with but seeing the policy side of things, I've seen some more like concrete ways that you can instigate positive change. And I've started recommending things like giving advice on how you can, you know, use these channels. So, for example, I was talking to an MP and um, they basically said that, you know, they made the point that the most important thing for members of parliament uh, and even just local authorities like your local council is that they get voted in the next year. Or if it's not them getting voted in, it's someone else from their party. So it's all it's all about them appeasing their constituents. They're not going to get voted in unless they do what their constituents say. So he said that in one year, for example, he might receive one letter from a constituent member uh, about plastic pollution, but then he would receive like 15,000 letters about changing a park bench. So even though he knows plastic pollution is more important than a park bench, if all it takes for him to get voted in again is to change a park bench, that is what they will do. So my message is now, Yes, do the beach cleans. Yes, talk to people. Yes, do the social media. Yes, do all of these amazing things that make you feel good. But write a letter to your MP. Write a letter saying that you care about plastic pollution and this is what they should do. If those 15,000 people that were writing about the park bench suddenly started writing about plastic pollution, the MPs would have no choice. They would have to do something. So I've seen the the power that we actually have as civilians, as citizens at these really high levels of decision making, because ultimately the government has to do what the majority says. That sounds great. I actually never knew about that at all. In fact, I, I, not did I never even considered about that at all. So following from that, is there any sort of uh, plan plan of action for the governing bodies to to like tackle um, plastic pollution? Is there anything the government are trying to do towards it? I mean, they have this massive action plan to tackle plastic pollution. It was launched when Theresa May was in power and it was this 25 year action plan to tackle plastic waste, which ends in 2042. So obviously that's a long way off. Um, what we are focusing on at Beach Guardian is looking at those those targets for 2042 and trying to bring some of them forward. Look at those low hanging fruits, those things that can be achieved quite simply uh, and and proceed with them faster. You know, there's things that they're working on at the moment, um, like a deposit return scheme, certain bans, changing plastic taxes, um, changing the um, the requirement for the inclusion of recycled content in new plastics, this kind of thing. But because of COVID, all of these things just kept getting pushed back. So mm. it's just really a case of keeping on top of what's going on in the government and 
nudging them, sending letters. When's the do- deposit return scheme coming? This kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And that sounds like one of the best plans of action by the sounds of it. I remember must have been like, what, 2016, 2017, when they made the plastic bags at your supermarket, they charged them 5p for it. Yeah. And I think that reduced plastic bag, um, you know, pollution by like 80%, was it something insane? It was huge. Yeah, it made such a huge difference. And the other good thing about that is that with those plastic bag charges that they instigated and in, implemented, that money goes to charity. So at Beach Guardian, we've received money um, from the Bags of Help scheme at Tesco's before. So, you know, these kind of initiatives are well supported within the community and the government needs to look at that success and do more things like it. That sounds great. So following on from the plan of action of the government, is there a plan of action you're saying to the people that are listening to this podcast? What is the plan of action you would say to the public on how they can tackle plastic pollution? Well, the first and easiest thing is to write a letter to your MP. I think, you know, that can take you 10 minutes of your day, post it off, and that can make a huge difference, especially if every single person does that. So I think, number one, my my number one piece of advice at the moment is to do that, especially as we come up to the next general election. Our power as voting people who are able to vote is 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 massive. So that definitely. And then, of course, the actual kind of proactive steps of doing a beach clean, going out into the environment and and taking the waste out of the environment in the first place. I think if you can combine stopping it at the source by messaging your MP and then removing the plastic that's already in the environment, that is like the perfect recipe to tackling plastic pollution. That sounds good. I think we'll end it there. That's a strong note. Plan of action. That's the best way to end a podcast, I think. So thank you very much, Emily, for coming. And uh, maybe we'll see you again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. It was really lovely to talk to you. It was very, very uh, engaging and interesting chat. Nice one. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.